so we're ready to start. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, the networking channel event on uh, vehicular networking. Uh, the organizers uh, are Professor Falco Dressler from Technical University of Berlin and uh, myself, Marco Aymon and Marsan, from uh, formerly with Politecnico di Torino, now with India Networks Institute in Madrid. We have uh, four uh, very distinguished uh, speakers uh, from uh, different uh, companies. Uh, maybe, Farco, you can move to the next slide. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> here you see uh, Onur uh, Altintas from Toyota. Fan Bai from General Motors, uh, Frank Hoffman from Bosch, and Volker Ziegler from Nokia. Um, when discussing about the organization of this event uh, with Falco, we thought that uh, it uh, would be very interesting to have uh, speakers from the industry to give us a picture of uh, what uh, is actually vehicular networking today, what are the challenges for tomorrow, uh, what we can expect, what is difficult, where uh, research contributions from us academicians are uh, useful and necessary. Uh, so, uh, since uh, Falco is much more expert than me in the domain, at this point, uh, I leave the floor to Falco uh, to uh, handle uh, the uh, uh, initial part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the panel. So, Falco, please, the floor is yours. Marco, thank you very much. And particularly, thanks a lot for, uh, for all the speakers to join. I know... Uh, for some of the speakers, it's a very uh, unfortunate time um, uh, when when joining from the S uh, in the in the early morning hours uh, uh, to this to this uh, uh, seminar for the Europeans. Uh, it's much more convenient in the in the afternoon, late afternoon. Um, so <clears throat> we have been working we have, uh, as a, as a community. We have been working on vehicle networking since quite some time, and uh, we thought it might be a good idea to use this uh, opportunity here in this uh, in this networking channel to do a kind of a reality check um so what happened uh, what uh, is currently going on and uh, what uh, what is possibly still missing um uh, we have uh, four very, very distinguished uh, uh, speakers here on board um uh, marco already introduced um, uh, all the all the four speakers the idea is uh, we give everybody here the floor for a brief introduction um of uh, who they are what they what they, their departments are doing and um, uh, then we move to uh, the more Q and A part uh, for this uh, for this uh, networking channel, which is the interesting part for the uh, interactions uh, with all the audience, of course. Um, so for that, I stop sharing um, the 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 screen, and um, I think we should go uh, forward with with all the with all the uh, speakers here for doing a short introduction of their. Um, of their um, ongoing uh, uh, activities. And um, um, so there is no particularly particular order uh, that, that we prepared for the for the presentations. Um, but if you just go by name, um, I, I saw uh, Uno had just some, some technical troubles, but he is back. Uno, do you like to start? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, I dropped for a couple of minutes. Uh, it was absolutely a technical issue, so I'm going to just uh, share my slides. Um, share screen. This. So I hope you are seeing what I see. We see a screen still not in presentation mode, but... Uh... How about this? Now it's perfect. Now it's perfect. Okay. Afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning to myself. 
my name is Andrew Altintas, uh, joining this um, panel from uh, California. I'm with uh, Toyota North America R&D uh, at Infotech Labs, I, uh, uh, the Infotech Labs fellow and also a um, senior executive uh, here. Um, so the title of my talk is, is Vehicle Networking. Uh, as opposed to the panel name, nuclear networking. Uh, so, uh, just a quick note that I, what I say here, what I show here, doesn't mean that my employer is agreeing with me. So, these are my uh, personal views. Um, therefore, uh, please don't take it as, as it is coming from uh, so the North America. Um, we are. We are located in Mountain View, California, United States. Uh, this place was established in April 2001, basically for uh, anything related to information and communication uh, to uh, about cars. So, uh, and, and we are the, not a pure research division, but an applied research division of Toyota North America R&D. Uh, with a vision of creating a connected mobile society. Um, well, I, for, I, forgive me, there is there is a black rectangle on on the right covering part of your screen. Uh, yeah, that it. one. Can, can you move that? Does this work? No, still there. Seriously. Okay. Now okay. it disappeared. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for uh, telling me about that. Um, so, uh, well, as we all know, uh, the, the esteemed panelists here <clears throat> are all going through this transportation. And it's, it's called that this is happening only once in 100 years. And uh, there's this enormous shape, uh, shift to case, which stands for connected automated share and electric light or electric uh, vehicles. Um, now I have another slides are insisting not to go to the next page. Um, but yeah, so when we talk about uh, vehicles and how they, they communicate, we're we are actually talking about a lot of uh, spectrum units. Um, if we start from the left, the uh, Japan, um, let's say DSRC system uses 760 megahertz. So the Toyota vehicles are already communicating among themselves over so this band, uh, which is uh, very unusual for the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is using or trying to use 5.9 gigahertz. And there's also, uh, we see Wi-Fi uh, cars, both in cabin and out cabin uh, within the five to six gigahertz band. Uh, we do have six tera 60 gigahertz um, unlicensed band in the millimeter waves. And also we are using uh, 76 to 81 gigahertz uh, automotive radar and, and uh, are also part of our research is also how to make these radar bands um, to be used also for uh, communications. Um, then let's uh, just a quick look at who's deploying what and where. Uh, like I said, we Toyota started in Japan in uh, 2015, uh, and there are right now more than 300,000 vehicles and more than uh, 110 interceptions all uh, operating at 760 megahertz. In the US, uh, I, it is almost zero deployment by the OEMs, uh, but there are some regional RSC deployments, of course, uh, but most of them are uh, trial cases or, or, uh, or uh, other or other uh, purposes. Europe, as we know, Volkswagen sold more than 1.5 million vehicles uh, equipped with DSRC. You call it ITS G5 in Europe, uh, but it's working on 5.9 uh, gigahertz band. And China is deploying FTV to X. So what does a connected car do? And these examples are coming from uh, Toyota in Japan. 
there are two types of services uh, in Japan. Uh, maybe I should say three. The first one is B2B only services. Uh, if you go from the left, the first one is cooperative adaptive cruise control. Cruise control evolved to adaptive cruise control, and adaptive cruise control evolved to the communication version of it, which is called cooperative adaptive cruise control. There's also first respond warning, oncoming vehicle warning if you're in an intersection, and uh, right turn support. Uh, in in US and most of Europe, it could be uh, left turn support. Um, if there's an intersection employed or, uh, deployed uh, with an RSU, a roadside unit, uh, there's this right turn caution. Uh, the RSU, the roadside unit, see what's happening in the, uh, around the intersection with cameras and, and uh, in some cases radars. Uh, there could be right turn caution uh, for either for uh, oncoming vehicles or some pedestrians crossing the street. There's uh, traffic light ahead, warnings, and, and time to green uh, counters. The, the third type is, of course, uh, when you buy a vehicle today, it is most likely to come with an embedded uh, cellular modem. Uh, and what it does is uh, continuously um, talks to the uh, auto manufacturer's um, cloud uh, or data center. Uh, it usually provides services such as predictive maintenance, over the software updates, network navigation, remote access to the vehicle, et cetera. And most cars today come with embedded cellular radios and in cabin Wi Fi. And external Wi Fi is um, coming pretty soon, and, and some, some automakers are deployed. Um, but what are they talking uh, in between themselves, except for the uh, cloud to car communications? Um, SAE recently classified the cooperation classes into uh, uh, four type of classes. I'm just showing three of them here. Uh, there's status sharing. Uh, it, it is the usual uh, basic safety messages or uh, public awareness messages in, in uh, Europe. Uh, it's just uh, telling what it is doing and who am I or who it is and what they say, see by way of their sensors. But yeah, there's also a, a category called intent sharing. Uh, it's not uh, like negotiation. You're just uh, telling the people around you that this is what I want to do or this is what I will do uh, in the next uh, few seconds. And of course, the... Uh, the uh, other category is negotiation. There's a pure request response protocol, and this is already being developed both in Europe and and the uh, United States. And so, if we come back to this connectivity level, my vision is that it's going to be a uh, combination of these different types. Some people, some vehicles, if they are uh, um, if they have the radios to talk B2V, vehicle to vehicle, they will do that. They will, uh, there's already vehicle to cloud. And uh, we are now seeing a lot of uh, weight or efforts towards vehicle to cloud to vehicle type of implementations. Um, with that, this is uh, our um, communications and computing vision. On top, there will be the cloud server, cloud and uh, data servers. In between, there could be edge servers, or we can also use, make use of virtual edge servers by way of grouping the vehicles together, uh, they have vehicle to vehicle communications, including Wi Fi. Um, so, I, before I, I am probably already over time, so I'd like to finish here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Uno. <clears throat> and, um, uh, uh, also, thanks for for keeping the time reasonable. Um, so we try to be sharp uh, in time um, for for the panelists, so that we have more time for Q and A in the in the in the end. Um, Fun. Do you like to continue? So let me share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. 
in presentation mode. Okay, so first, uh, thank the uh, you know Foco and uh, for the and uh, Professor Michael for the introduction, and I think her honor sensei gave a very good uh, overview and uh, of her vehicular wireless network and uh, from the automotive and uh, industry perspective, and uh, so. To follow and also in this presentation, I think the uh, also suggests me to talk about what is uh, could be another research new frontier, and uh, so I will mainly focus on, you know, what we can do and uh, beyond V2X and the leverage the capability to do more things. So, particular today's topic will be the cooperative transfer sharing. So. As we know, and the vehicle become smarter and smarter, equipped with a lot of uh, advanced sensor to provide the so-called situation awareness in the pro uh, near vicinity of the cars, and uh, this include the camera, lidar, radar type of things here. And uh, so this is a well published is the picture, and uh, different camera here have different, and so this is very well known and uh, for the people who love the advanced cars. And so with all those great uh, new sensor modality, camera and uh, LiDAR, radar, and I think that uh, indeed uh, provide a much better situation awareness about the nearby and the object, including the vehicles, the pedestrian, and uh, the bicyclist. However, all of them face one challenge, and uh, they are mainly the long size sensing capability and for example in this picture and uh, i use a lidar as an example and you can see once you've been blocked the car by cars nearby cars and uh, the sensor couldn't detect what behind the cars so that's all the void and the shadow and it comes in and so essentially that the so all of the mainstream sensor i was least limited and the long size and the challenge they face here to make that happen, and uh, very naturally, as a networking guys and uh, yeah, the community and the focal on all since I and I were in, and as a community, think about can we leverage either the vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to cloud back to vehicle capability to enable the sensor sharing and uh, capability. So vehicle A's sensor can share with the vehicle B and. Uh, Particularly in the region, we could be heavily so blind spot type of a situation or not non emphasis blockage situation. So essentially, that that's a, a piece of work. Uh, my team and my co my collaborator did almost uh, five years or six years ago, <laughs> and the time passed, passed so fast. So essentially, the idea is proposing can we leverage the communication and with the sensor sharing capability to benefit to really benefit the future, I would say, advanced uh, ADAS vehicle or even autonomous driving vehicles. And uh, so to address this uh, capability and uh, as a research people, we care about the three things, how to really provide the accurate positioning and uh, how to deal with the limited V2V bandwidth. And also finally, because this system is really the mission critical system, how to reduce the low latency. So I would just give a very high level and uh, capability showing there for accurate positioning. And I think that the GNSS uh, showed, the GPS really showed a great advantage on that part. But uh, when you really want to do this uh, high accuracy positioning, uh, sensor sharing capability, and you need more advanced capability beyond the GNS GPS capability. And so very naturally, slam each upon the cloud and uh, localization and mapping will be needed. And uh, by using this uh, high precision 3D on the cloud feature, and uh, you are able to drive much kind of a lower level of uh, positioning Arrow and this is the serve the capability here. So that's definitely one of the things that the industry and the research community is looking very actively these days. And uh, not only, you know, to a few car makers, but the overall society is, uh, is looking to that part. And the second part is uh, even we have enlarged uh, V2X. Uh, bandwidth and also thanks to 5G and you have much boosted uh, and the bandwidth, but the bandwidth uh, for net, for networking people is always uh, the issue we need to optimize. 
So the very high level idea is that rather than share all of the sensors and at all the time, and you can really run a very intelligent uh, solution and to pick the most valuable content to share with each other. And so in that case, we can manage and to provide the high utility function to each other and by using the most valuable sensor and uh, information and uh, well control the bandwidth usage and uh, which is uh, normally have a cost implication as well. So last but not least is uh, latency. Latency is because you, you know that from day zero when we to X and uh, for for collision avoidance so for many of the feature and all those things that elaborate on how the auto industry invasion, how this one can comes in and uh, this low latency is uh, from day zero is uh, the, the critical requirement and uh, for the automotive engineers like Onosens and myself. So in this uh, new advanced sensor sharing capability and uh, the data is uh, much bigger than what we've been doing in the past two decades about the BSM, all those things here. So to make that happen, you essentially need to very carefully manage the whole processing pipeline and enable the parallelization and try to really decompute, decouple the computation and the transmission and all those things here. And so a lot of what I would say is smart networking and uh, parallelization and uh, pipelining capability need to be done and many of the audience and us as a networking researcher are very familiar with and uh, some of the prior method and uh, could be used here. So we, we did very similar things on, on that part and try to really squeeze the latency to satisfy the traditional way to x 100 millisecond kind of requirement and then looks like uh, we indeed achieve that, that part. So that's pretty much like uh, how to really address, come back uh, to the very high level and uh, um, how to enable the more active position and how to use the use of the values and uh, how to control the latency. It's a kind of a research challenge when we envision the next generation with us so when they want to share not only about the BSM or intention, but also about a more advanced sensor. And we need to address those things. And for people who are interested in detail, and the paper is published in Open Domain, and feel free to read the paper. So I think that's a pretty much a conclude and uh, my part, but I will say that's the one for the potential from research frontier and our community could further contribute to the advancement of a vehicle network. Thank you very much, uh, Fran, for the for the nice uh, overview of uh, your very recent research. Uh, just going alphabetically further, uh, that would lead us to Frank. Okay, thank you. Um... Try to share my screen now. So I think you can see my screen now. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. Um, maybe a short introduction to myself. I'm Frank Hoffmann, working in corporate research from Bosch um, here in Hildesheim in the northern part of Germany. Currently, I have uh, two roles. Uh, first, I'm a chief expert for communication systems. That means I'm responsible here for strategy and roadmap for the research uh, for communication systems in general. That means not only in the vehicular domain, but also in the industrial domain, building technology and so on. Um, and my second role is I'm a group manager. I have quite a huge team here working on communication systems. Um, this one very important topic, what we have today is the vehicular networking. Um, in my slides, I want to show you, uh, I have two goals mainly. The first one, I want to show you what we already achieved here in vehicular communication. And the second one is, um, what is the outlook? What could be a next big step for us? Um, as you know, we have uh, on the one side, direct vehicle to vehicle communication for different use cases. We have vehicle to infrastructure communication on a direct way where we communicate with traffic lights or cameras. And the third uh, communication path is the vehicle to network, uh, which we need also for different use cases. 
which I want to show you on the next slide here. Here I have again these three different technologies um, with some dedicated use cases. For a typical use case for direct communication is the connected adaptive cruise control, where we do the provision and speed and lane change intention uh, between vehicles. So we can improve the currently available adaptive cruise control um, by additional information which we get from other vehicles. That means, for example, um, uh, information about change lane um, or information about uh, changing the speed so that the ACC can be adapted much easy, easier. Um, and then if you look at a more sophisticated use case, the corporate driving maneuver um, is a very good example where we um, exchange also the intention. That means we exchange trajectory between the vehicles. Um, on the figure, you can see quite easily um, if, for example, one, the red car wants to change lane, uh, sends the trajectory to the other vehicle so that the other vehicles can adapt their speed accordingly, which helps also quite a lot uh, for automated vehicles. Um, both the connected ACC and the corporate driving, uh, we already presented in demonstration um, uh, in public funded projects is that we have here already a quite stable uh, research. Um, nevertheless, especially for the corporate driving, um, standardization is ongoing and I expect that there will be also uh, still some challenging uh, questions to be solved here in research. If we look at the direct vehicle to infrastructure communication, I think you are aware about uh, traffic light communication where you get information of, about signal phase and timing of the oncoming traffic. I think that's quite well known. We see spot and map messages um, and which we also have uh, partly in deployment. Um, something new is the VRU protection with the collective perception. That means the detection of vulnerable road users as pedestrian at crossings and the provision of this object data to the surrounding vehicles. Um, that's also something we presented already um, in demonstration, which works quite well. Um, you can use here camera systems or LiDAR radar systems um, to sense the environment. That means not only uh, we are used, but also all other objects and transfer this information to the surrounding vehicles. Um, in Europe, we are here in already quite well standardization phase at Etsy, but also there is in the US uh, some first standard available uh, for the deployment of these use cases. If we look at the vehicle to network communication, what we see already on the roads, roads is the hazardous warnings so that you get information about road condition and so on. Um, collect all these information, for example, by crowdsourcing from other vehicles. And so you can inform vehicles about critical situation. If you look at a more sophisticated use case, you can use, for example, teleoperation of vehicles, um, maybe on a yard for truck drivers, so that they can have a rest. Or also, if you think about an automated vehicle, which can uh, which cannot solve a dedicated uh, driving situation at a parking lot, for example, a remote operation operator could take over and um, control the vehicle and drive the vehicle to a different uh, place. That's also something we demonstrated also, but also here we see still some um, challenges in research, uh, which are of interest. Looking now into more into the future, um, what we have seen from the last uh, slides here that we are quite confident about all these QM function, what we call them in the automotive domain, about simple warning use cases, about intervening maneuvers, but which are controlled by the driver somehow or which are controlled by certified sensors as radar or leader. So we do not uh, run 
different driving maneuvers purely on V2X up to now. Um, but what we have already in the field is so to say safety in a closed world. Um, here, I think I have to first to explain what we mean here with functional safety, because uh, functional safety means keep your system from harming humans. That means availability, reliability, integrity uh, has to be solved in before. And in this AVP, what we call automated valid parking use case, um, the vehicle is completely automated but is run by the infrastructure, not by the vehicle itself. The, there is infrastructure sensors available um, and the vehicle gets only driving maneuvers and um, it's a certified system, but sender and receiver are part of one safety concept. And that's something which is also in deployment. Um, that means we solve the safety topics here. We got a certification here. Um, and that's really a major milestone. If you look now at research, then we have one open question here. How to get functional safety in an open world system? That means if you have not a dedicated use case as in AVP, but you want to be use case agnostic. That means you get information from a many from many uh, traffic participants as uh, pedestrians or other vehicles, but you want also to uh, drive critical intervening maneuvers based on this V2X information. That means you have to know um, from which control unit do you get the uh, information. Is it an ASIL certified control unit or not? Uh, what is the data uh, quality and so on? And that's something which is not really uh, solved up to now. There are some first ideas how to go forward. There are some discussion rounds, for example, in Etsy and some research paper. But here I expect that there's still a long way to go uh, to solve it. But it's really necessary because otherwise we always need the additional sensors, um, which are ASIL certified for critical intervening maneuvers. And what we want to run in future is uh, also to run these intervening maneuvers purely on V2X. So that would be the outlook. Then thank you for the um, for your attention, and then we can go to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Um, uh, Volker, I'm very sorry you have the wrong last name, so this puts you last in the list. Um, uh, but nevertheless, not least. Um, so Volker, your stage. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Marco Marco, for the opportunity. Let me try share my screen. So this is about the future. It's about the future of vehicular networks and the path to 6G. I know uh, this may come as a shock to some of you since uh, we have, what, six more years to go, seven or eight years to go with 5G. And maybe we shouldn't dilute the attention as we have now finally up and running and uh, the engagement level with the automotive industry in particular. And by the way, Onua, coming back to your speech, uh, you um, uh, like just forgot, forgot, uh, uh, there was no, there is no slide yet. Okay, your screen share is loading. That's what it's saying. Uh, I see you, which is nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting a message. Screen share is loading. Okay. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe do, I do stop share and try again. Maybe so. But it still shows a shared screen with some Q and A. Uh, Frank, is it still your screen? Um, no. Just to be on the safe side. Yeah, I'm getting the same message here. Your screen share is loading. That's the message I'm getting. What I see on the screen is how Sidelinks is used in B2B and the uh, start of an, of an Oh, okay. But um, 
Yeah, it's probably Franklin sharing this a small window. Stop sharing. I think Franklin need to stop sharing and then work on can share. But I already stopped the share. Okay. No. Oh, ah, okay. Now uh, we see it. Holger, very sorry, uh, but now, now finally, please go ahead. No, that's just fine. Thanks, Frank, for <laughs> for this. So, anyways, uh, future of data networks. So, path to six G. And I said, I think Onua, we heard you talk about a hundred years uh, renewal cycle for automotive. Now, when it comes to mobile networks, as you are well aware, we have probably something of a ten-year cycle. This is exciting times because we are getting closer to basically agreeing on what the foundational 6G release, release 21 will be two years away from now. And what I'd like to do in the next seven minutes is to give you a quick view in terms of what that future will look like, uh, Julie, from a more networks perspective. And so let's dive right into this in terms of opportunities, in terms of groundwork for vehicular networks that has been broadly done. And I guess, uh, Frank, you remember this. We had, when was it? The uh, A9 highway trial, 2015, edge cloud, connected cars. Uh, it's a long way back. So we uh, successfully put in the groundwork in conjunction with uh, release uh, 8 or 13, definitely, and 14. Now 15, 16, of course, 5G new radio. And all of this now merging, if you like, into an exciting trajectory of opportunity. And that's the upper part of the slide of the chart. And there's a timeline in the middle in case you're not aware. So what is now happening is definitely really 17 ecosystem expansion, including automotive, 5G advance coming up with a lot more emphasis on uplink, just to name that part, uh, as well as XR functionality. And when you look at the upper part of the slide, now there's a number of uh, technology building blocks, very relevant also for automotive and V2X, broadly speaking. So there is this uh, architectural element of transformation, cloud RAN, hybrid RAN, and also open RAN. You have that notion of spectrum. And uh, I think one of the previous speakers already showed the uh, kind of spectrum areas as we have, there is now, Exciting news in terms of new spectrum, also World Radio Conference, good news. Uh, we, we are getting additional bands and that's uh, particularly relevant like upper 6G. Ultimately, we'll also see millimeter wave. But I think the one element that really is important also for automotive is this uh, notion of networks going 3D. Now 3D in the sense of three-dimensional non-terrestrial. And that of course is of very high relevance potentially also to, uh, to cars and automotive. Why? Because it's all about ubiquitous coverage, and maybe we can come back to this. Um, in terms of uh, high-level themes, clearly carrier aggregation, 5G advanced network modernization, what we should also highlight is the theme of automation and cooperation, which indeed is one of the key themes also for the automotive families of use cases. And all of this lower right-hand corner of the slide links into societal value, right? This is what the ambition I would argue is truly about, um, not, just of, not just out of Nokia. And by the way, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure to work with the fun part of Nokia, uh, technology and strategy, strategy and technology unit, uh, including, it's a big unit, including Bell Labs, research, including standards, uh, technology leadership at large. So our ambition here clearly is, and I think we share this, it's about societal impact and value zero fatality, environmental sustainability, and inclusion, inclusion in the sense of, of uh, uh, traffic and transport here in particular. So with this uh, building the connectivity platform, just uh, giving this a quick look in terms of where do we stand, what's the outlook here, I'm quoting upper end of the upper part of the chart, numbers from a, uh, from a consultancy firm, uh, analyst firm, maybe a research, and you can see uh, what it looks like. It's it's great news in a couple of uh, ways. Why? So definitely vehicles do use, do use 4G LTE as well as 5G networks connectivity and uh, as well as uh, LTE 5G V2X direct communications. And who would have thought a couple of years back, but great news now we have huge momentum all over the world as we got cellular connectivity, and uh, so here, as I see, yes, it's still there, but it's comparatively speaking, not as significant. And we all converge on that notion of cellular, which I think is great. Why? 
because it allows you to go for an economy of scale and leveraging the standard. When you look at some of the promises, uh, now some folks would argue myths, but I think these benefits are real. So it is, and this links into economy of scale aspect, aspect. it links into lower costs through the use of existing networks. And uh, the same would be broadly true for the automotive industry, but it's of cost saving, uh, leveraging existing networks and or general elements of build out. And then of course, also a motivator here, now this would be for the communication service providers, the operators to really go for new opportunity in terms of revenue and growth, uh, hosting potentially roadside units and thereby providing higher value ultimately to the automotive industry. So what you can see here, by the way, is clearly uh, a need for and um, a momentum as regards uh, collaboration. Collaboration will be key, ecosystem collaboration. That's also, um, of course, a challenge at the same time, but ultimately we are confident it will happen. Why? Because there's all the benefits associated both for the drivers, more safe, uh, more efficient, as well as for the, for the public at large and societal acceptance will be important. With this, maybe moving to the last slide I wanna share here so that we have some time for discussion. Falco, um, everyone. So this now is indeed, um, and um, it's an exciting perspective in terms of bringing the vehicular future to life now for the 30s. So uh, this is the long-term future, if you like. What you see here um, are the six key technology areas for the six essential infrastructure. As you can see, they include spectrum, especially new bands going up all the way to sub terahertz. AI na native AI interface, we can discuss this more, but it's more generic in terms of enabler. But then there is uh, clearly four domains, if you like, technology buckets that really have huge promise and potential for uh, the automotive families of use cases, both in dimensions um, of uh, you know, automated traffic as well as traffic efficiency and safety. And this is a network as a sensor. So the key idea here is that we would truly utilize networks that are built for communication purposes, also for sensing purposes. It's uh, pretty cool stuff. And we have made a lot of progress, especially out of Germany, as Falco, you are aware. There's the architectural element of uh, transformation. And this goes deep. We could discuss this for the full day. Um, probably what I would highlight here, obviously, is the element of cognition, so AI kicking in, but also the option to go for specialized architecture. What do I mean by this? And this links into extreme connectivity options. You would have like a car could be like a dedicated network in its own right. And now in a simple case, you would have like a gateway. You would reduce or optimize, tailor the protocol stack within the car, linking into wide area network, just as to illustrate this. So in X, in car, and then some performance attributes as needed within that uh, special uh, setting would be what we would associate with extreme connectivity in terms of both bandwidth, latency, and or reliability or other attributes of performance. And last but not least, just to highlight this, security, trust, and privacy. Privacy in particular, very important areas of research. And just to hint at this, one of my favorite areas is the way we basically share workload between car and edge and network and how to do that in a private uh, fashion. And there's a lot of cool ways to do it, homomorphic encryption, the way you share the load among different edge players. Um, so as to wrap up, so these are areas of high potential relevance, not next, next year, but uh, in the 30s, mid 30s probably. Um, and then last point to be briefly made is on the left-hand side indicated what is 6J day one focus, what is it that we try to deliver by end of 29? And there's two themes particularly relevant for automotive. The one is resilient connectivity, dependable and real time. And then of course, big time, very important, and we can discuss this more, ubiquitous connectivity by integrating TN and NTN. So terrestrial networks and non-terrestrial. And of course, as you are aware, thanks to all the LEO constellations, low Earth orbit satellite and constellations now increasingly up and running, some of them with direct to device, by the way, many of them powered by Nokia. This will be cool stuff and really enriching and transforming the paradigm. With this, back over to you, Falco. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Volker, for sharing these uh, these insights. Um, very much appreciated, actually. Um, uh, so this, so thanks a lot to all the experts here. By the way, um, uh, uh, this is a wonderful starter for this for this uh, uh, networking uh, uh, channel panel today. 
Um, Marco and I, we prepared um, a few kickoff questions um, for the for the Q&A part. Um, I, even though we are a little late in time, I, I still like to go through a few of them, um, having having the questions only dedicated to a single panelist um, uh, and uh, try to I don't know. I make the question very short. You you try to be brief in the in the in the in, in your discussion, and then we switch to uh, uh, all the questions from the panel from from the attendees in in today's meeting. Um, reminder: Please uh, write your Q uh, questions into the Q and A uh, form so that we can uh, go to these questions in a second. So my idea is we again prepared a few questions. Um, so. Um, when we when we do that, um, I have one question per panelist. Um, so it's quite unknown to the panelists which, which question goes to whom. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, with Frank. Um, uh, what networking features do I get when I buy a car next year? Okay, thank you for the question, Falco. Um, I have to think about it. Um, there's a personal view and also the few from an automotive supplier, but I want to start maybe with a kind of no-brainer. That means we will see 5G technology in the vehicle. Um, up to now, typically you have it in more or less every smartphone, but typically the automotive industry is not as fast as the smartphone industry. And here, especially the MBB features, that means high bandwidth, which is needed in the vehicle, uh, will be soon available and or is already available in a few in a few uh, cars, but will be standard equipment in every car. I doubt a little that we see UR LLC and MMTC features in the short term, um, especially UR LLC. We expect quite uh, good improvements for some of the functionality. Nevertheless, it will take some time because it's shown that uh, these features are not available yet in the uh, public networks. Um, mm -hmm. Another topic which I think is really promising is non-terrestrial networks, mm -hmm. um, because what we also see the uh, coverage is not as good as we mm -hmm. uh, want to have in some of the countries. And uh, 5GA started with use case analysis, and also in 3GPP in release 19 we see uh, next steps. I think that's something we will see. A third point is V2X direct communication. I think the the numbers increases quite well here in Europe, but also uh, US decided here for CVX to uh, to implement on release 14, and that's also something which I expect to see soon in vehicles. And I think these are three typical three technologies um, but also if you look from the functional say from the functional side um, it's not only about safety but it's also about comfort uh, when thinking about offloading of functionality that means that you use compute resources in the cloud or in the edge uh, for new more complex functionality mm -hmm. uh, based on ai there yeah uh um, more than I expected. So let's see. I, I trust I, I will um, uh, check double check next year with what is in the market, and I get back to you. <laughs> and uh, so let's let's move on. Uh, second question we have. Um, so we have done so much uh, research. You know, going back more on the research side. Um, uh, cooperative driving, cooperative perception, fun. You you talked a lot about uh, distributed sensing, cooperative perception as a as a as a main field. Um, what's coming next? What is missing? So, um, from a from a car maker's perspective, from your own perspective, um, are there any totally open questions? Yeah. So I, I will say that from my own perspective, research perspective, and I have the same disclaimer as Arnold since I have in his slides. And so I, I will say that uh, you know. Here's a two same here. One is uh, for this uh, community, we've been studying peer to peer and uh, distributed networking, and uh, for almost uh, two decades, and uh, it's uh, still evolving. And you can pretty much the piping is being built, and the research network architecture is being built. It's really a matter of how to enable more and more richer content. Uh, the work I present is one for the example, and among many other kind of potential, and enrich the content aspect of that. And I think that the 
other organizations that showed SAE and a couple of other standard community mm -hmm. is working towards that part. It seems to be on the right track. The other thing I think, uh, coming back to your missing part, I think that uh, here's always a harmonization between the so-called uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer network and uh, in the past uh, two decades, and with a more centralized uh, cellular-centric one, and uh, how to really kind of build a more holistic uh, and uh, architecture. I think that's uh, using both the strengths of a cellular network as uh, also a workflow and, uh, and a workflow. Uh, Frank to talk about that. This is a traditional peer to peer and distributed and really harmonize and put more integrated. I think that uh, might be the next uh, research frontier and for this community for both uh, basic research and also applied researchers and just like me and uh, on those things. I, I fully agree. I fully agree. I remember uh, some some uh, panel discussion some years back at uh, IEEE VNC, Vehicular Networking Conference, when there was almost a fight uh, uh, between the cellular and the and the Wi-Fi based uh, world, now we see more harmonization between between all the technologies, which I very much appreciate actually. Um, so um, I have another question, and this is a tough one um, uh, for UNO actually. So uh, the sometimes from a from a from a researcher's perspective, we think of um, uh, this is a simple algorithm, and um, uh, come on, this this cannot be so so complicated. Uh, but uh, if it's getting that really into the field, might be super complicated. Uh, and sometimes it's exactly the opposite. Um, any any sorts of that? You have done a lot of uh, field trials and uh, and demos. Um, uh, any anything that comes to mind? What is easy? What is not so easy? Um. Thank you for that difficult question. <laughs> First of all, the, the putting that extra radio of vehicular communications on the car is, is a uh, very difficult first step um, in terms of the cost, in terms of the initial benefits that it brings. Uh, because uh, like like someone said it many years ago, I think it was Professor Schlodover, it is like the fax machine. Uh, when it first came out, it was like, uh, okay, I want to buy this new thing, but who am I going to send uh, messages to if people around don't have fax messages? The same scenario here. But um, every car you put on the road, with this extra functionality will help the uh, roads become safer gradually. It's a slow process. Um, that's the first most difficult part. And this, after that, I think we will soon realize that there are many things that we want to do beyond the basic safety messages or cams, uh, already there is a great deal of standardization, uh, like uh, Fan Sensei was alluding to, the bandwidth is, um, will be a, a crucial asset to be able to do what we want to do, such mm -hmm. as cooperative perception, such as cooperative maneuvering. Um, of course, we need to be aware of the energy requirements of those radios and messages working all the time inside the car <clears throat> as we are moving towards more um, carbon neutrality or carbon conscious world we need to be thinking about those things as well uh, and and just going randomly um coverage is still an issue um, in mm -hmm. most places, um, even where I live, the coverage is an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so depending on an always connected thing uh, is still difficult. So, so I'm uh, also assuming that we will see satellites, uh, whether the geosatellites yeah. or the geosatellites coming into scene. Uh, and uh, we do have research on to. Uh, and, and we know that for safety reasons, some automakers have already started putting uh, satellite radios on top of the car and on the bottom of the car. If it flips, 
Yeah, so that's a uh, difficult question, and my answers were uh, random. Probably I left out many, many other difficult things to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uno. And I, I fully agree. So um, we run through many of the problems that you mentioned already, um, because we also try to do field experiments. Uh, so I know how hard many of these of these questions really are. Um, I have one more that is probably even tougher um, for now, Volker. You talked a lot about uh, standardization also. Uh, Falco, uh, no, excuse no, let's me. Put it... Falco, let, let, let's speak at least. Uh, the, we have a few questions on uh, from the audience. Let, let, yeah. Let's speak at least some of those. Otherwise, uh, I, 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 I agree. I agree. One quick yeah. one for still for Volker. I, I try to have this super fast, super super um, uh, complicated question, and then we go just for the for the for the attendees. No, I, I think, thank you, Falco and Marco. We'll come to some of the audience questions in a minute, but give me the opportunity to maybe just briefly comment. Falco, it's, it's, it's a wonderful question. It's a very relevant question at this time. Why? There's geopolitical context. There's a risk of fragmentation. So it's important that we openly discuss as to what the value of global standards is and continues to be. I think that's comment number one. Uh, when it comes to regulation, uh, linking into standards, um, I guess ultimately, we, in many cases, we do not need government in intervention. Let's be clear. Uh, standards should be industry driven. Yes, absolutely. We need to build on the strengths as we have had, continue to have in Western countries in particular, right? Uh, which is market driven, industry driven. So summarizing also, I continue to feel that standards are an enabler. And why is that? And maybe just to uh, illustrate this with one more uh, observation, you know, it starts out with research. And then we kind of meet up, discuss different approaches, and hopefully agree on what the best technical approach is uh, in a uh, free competitive, very open exchange and move that to standard. That's definitely still the way 3GP operates. We need to defend this. We also need to make sure that not one uh, economic uh, area dominates everybody else. I think we, in the meantime, this has been mitigated. So. Standards matter, industry-driven, market-driven, and regulation can also be an enabler, but we need to stay away from over-regulating. With this, uh, Marco, over to you for some of the audience questions. So, Falco, thank you. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, um, we have a few questions. Uh, I don't know how much, but uh, let me go in order. We have uh, a question on uh, what are the key security challenges for connected vehicles. And uh, well, I think Volker was uh, the one who touched on this topic. So I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yes, I can briefly expand. I, I think, again, a wonderful question. Security, trust, and privacy. So, so these are, it's a whole taxonomy of elements that uh, relate, uh, especially also the automotive sector. And um, I guess the one area that probably I would highlight at this time, when I look to the future now with digital twins coming up, all kind of extended reality use cases and both cooperative as well as safety oriented, it'll be very important to look at not just uh, resilient connectivity, but also assuring data integrity and privacy. Right, and, and I think one of the cool areas to be explored more, I hinted at this before, Marco, is how we smartly uh, deal with sensor data information from the car to the edge. And uh, as said, some of the areas of research out of Bell Labs, Nokia Bell Labs include encryption, homomorphic encryption. This means you, you work on data that kind of look like the original data, but they are not or multi-party compute means that you will never share all the data with a single edge operator, but with several of them. And, and these are just two elements to make this happen. And last but not least, let's keep in mind, one way to securitize whatever we do, we need to also make sure we tie this into hardware. So software only, it'll always be zero trust, means you need to do a lot of monitoring. But I think one of the elements to also provide security, Marco, is to link into hardware by means of trusted execution environment, trusted platform modules. And that, again, is a concept that cuts across, including the cars themselves, but holistically tackling the end-to-end uh, -end architecture, if you like. OK, thank you very much. Uh, 
One uh, other question, which uh, could be quick. I don't know who of you wants to pick that up. Uh, uh, we had this question. When we talk about uh, uh, low latency, uh, what values are we talking about? Well, I so, can take that one. It's a one hundred traditionally rule of thumb is a one hundred millisecond is what we call networking peer to peer cares about. And from very almost uh, fifteen years ago, when V two apps BSM and the one hundred millisecond is a kind of a rule F, you can receive the message from other vehicle within one hundred millisecond, and then they can take that into the next uh, computation and the decision cycle. And uh, so this is kind of a rule for some one hundred millisecond is a little bit kind of a, I'll say that the so practical engineers say, okay, can we really squeeze that around one hundred millisecond each? So this is, of course, is end to end. So from uh, yeah. from one vehicle to another vehicle. Yes. And uh, let me just by my own curiosity add one thing. Uh, and what uh, what loss probability could be tolerated uh, since there is an intrinsic redundancy inside the, uh, whatever messages are transmitted? You mean the packet drop rate? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that one is a relatively less well studied, but definitely is, uh, you know, if you look at all the past uh, DSRC and the, the new Bitwax uh, standard, and the people really try to control that uh, less than 1%. And, uh, but uh, it's a little bit overshooting because <laughs> the, the redundancy kind of a peer, periodical broadcast can handle much higher packet drop rate, but uh, really to play safe because this is a fundamentally is a mission critical system engineer and uh, have the tendency to be very conservative. So that's why like uh, 8.11 standard and the new civic web standard really try to shoot for this 1%, uh, less than 1% packet drop in, in deployment. Okay, thank you very much. Then on the chat, I have one more question for uh, Volker. Uh, what is the situation with road operators regarding their preferred wireless technologies? Yeah, I think in increasingly road operators are aware that indeed uh, 4G, LTE, 5G, uh, other technologies of choice. What I think Marco uh, and whoever the, the gentleman or lady was who asked the question. What's kind of still holding us back, I guess, is is the speed of rollout and and the network effect. I think we discussed some of this earlier, but I'm confident we are confident. Okay, ultimately it'll happen. Uh, but the technology choice per se now, you've, you've seen the statistics in terms of uh, uptake uh, V2X overall uh, data set from one of the analysts. So I think there we are fairly clear, and that that actually is is, is good news. Um, however, having said this, going back to Frank Falco's question, we should still argue for technology neutrality. We don't need government intervention, but clearly at this time, Marco, uh, fundamental choices have been made and road operators are aware. Um, that's how I would summarize the current situation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, they are calling uh, us uh, uh, to order because uh, the time uh, is restricted to one hour. We are already a few minutes over. So let me uh, thank again very much uh, our uh, speakers. I think this has been very interesting, very informative. Uh, and uh, let me thank Falco, who did most of the work in organizing this. Uh, I would like to mention uh, extremely briefly the fact that, uh, as you probably know, uh, these events of the networking channel have uh, a two-week uh, uh, periodicity, and uh, the next event is going to be in two weeks. Uh, very interesting topic, which is, are we leaving the long-awaited AI revolution for networking with generative AI? So if you're interested in uh, AI and networking, uh, uh, please uh, plan to attend uh, to attend the next uh, the next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's organized by Matt Cesar from uh, Illinois, and the keynote speaker is uh, again. We try also to have uh, to always have very very uh, well known people, and is uh, Jean Pierre Vasseur 
uh, from Cisco. So with this, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, to Falco, thanks to the speakers, thanks to the audience. Uh, without uh, the audience, uh, this is meaningless. So thanks for joining. And uh, I hope we'll see you next time at the next event of the Networking Channel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.